Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. Exactly. <laughs> Isaiah chapter 9. Join me there if you like. It's page 683 in your Bibles. Page 683, or bring your own Bible and look at it. And it's a great, great passage. Nice to be with Chapel Street. I love your name. And I, and I watched the video, and it means get the chapel out on the street. And now the street comes in here, and we're together to do that. But thanks. Nice to be with you. My name is Newt. K-N-U-T-E, uh, named after Newt Rockney from Notre Dame, and I know most of you are Notre Dame fans. Yes, I see one hand. <laughs> Thank you. There's one. Is there another? Jeff, please. Oh, come on. Uh, I came over. We live right on the other side of uh, uh, the lake, Michigan, so I, I came over last evening uh, on windsurfing, and the funny thing was I met Jeff and Kenton swimming over to get me, and I, I picked them up on my windsurfer, and if you believe that, then don't listen to any more of the talk. <laughs> Jesus of the prophets, what a great assignment, Isaiah chapter 9. In the middle of darkness, in the middle of pain, a, a, a leader who was very selfish, and all kinds of sins at their uh, capital city, but all over the tribes of Judah and Israel too, comes Isaiah's prophecy and what he says. It's a day, a, a day of darkness. In fact, the last verse of chapter 8 is probably as, as, as hellish as you could get a verse in the Bible. And it says, and they will look to the earth, but behold, distress and darkness, the gloom of anguish and they will be thrust into thick darkness. Whoa. It sounds like hell, and it's meant to be like that. This is the, this is the chosen nation in a day of gloom. And then he starts off, chapter 9, but there will be no gloom for her who was in anguish. What a way to start a sermon. What a way to start a chapter. There will be no gloom. God, who sees everything at once, says, a light is coming. You guys, this is for me and for you for tomorrow and for today. A light is coming. There will be no gloom. Now, the leader of Israel was selfish. The little people were mistreated. They even called them that. They looked down on many people, including widows and children in many cases. Church attendance was way down. They called it temple worship. People were hurting each other in a very wrong way, and the nation had been tormented by Syria. Does it sound familiar? Tiglath Peleazar, can never say his name right, the third, had led captives out of Judah. So gloom was everywhere. And then all of a sudden, Isaiah, in chapter 9, having given a sign, he says, God's light comes, verse 2. He says, in the former time, middle of 1, in the former time, he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, think Holy Land, but in the latter time, he has made glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. And everybody who read it in those days went, huh? He's made it dark, but something's going to happen. He's made it glorious. Verse 2, you know this verse if you've been to the Messiah. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwell in a land of deep, deep darkness, on them the light shined. There's an outline on your bulletin if you'd like to follow. It's a good help. You'll know, if nothing else, you'll know about when I'm going to be done. <laughs> I get done right when I get to the bottom. 
But it starts off, God's light comes and the gloom is everywhere. I've just described it in little phrases, but it's, it's all over the land and the people have it personally. That's what I must remember. This wasn't just over Judah and parts of Israel, but it was, they didn't have hope. Nobody went around saying, well, a few did, uh, but most people didn't go around saying, someday, remember, a child of David, a great, 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 great grandson of David will come and be on the earth and rule over it. But here he just says, there's change coming. And part of the change, well, he starts in verse 2. Well, look what he says, the people who walked in darkness, a great light. Light is the theme of this whole revelation. Verse 3, you have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as they are glad when they divide the spoil. Something's coming, someone, we know ahead of the uh, time, someone who's coming, kids, who's going to rule and be Lord but bring light by what he says and the way he lives. And everyone who reads this, and as I probably thought at first, huh, who is this? Look at the next verse which describes what will happen. Verse three, you have multiplied the nation, you have increased the, its joy, they rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest as they are glad when they divide the spoil for the yoke of his burden and the staff for his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor you have broken as on the day of Midian. He's saying there's going to be victory like there was at times before and the enemy's going to be destroyed. And the people are, uh, when is this? Look at verse 5. For every boot of the tramping warrior in battle tumult and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. Ain't going to be no war no more, no more. There's going to be a new day. And everybody in Israel kind of hiding from God and certainly from their enemies is going, when's this? This is Isaiah speaking as a prophecy of what's ahead. And as we look at it, I'm reminded that Jesus, who's going to fulfill this prophecy, you're already thinking ahead, is the light of the world. A light has come. When he would be born, 400 years of silence, no prophecies, nothing from above, would be interrupted by the gentle knocking on a door of an inn in Bethlehem of Joseph and his fiancée. Do you have any room? It would be interrupted by light from heaven over shepherds who would say, unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior. And they would follow the light and it would be over a manger. And on their way would be wise men from the east who would follow a light. The light has dawned. And we already know this. Many of you, his name is Jesus. Who would say, I am the light of the world. Whose best friend said of him, he was the true light. <laughs> which lights every man that comes into the world. Whoa. Do you believe that? Are you in him like this? Unto you a light will come. By the way, in Matthew chapter 4, when Jesus begins his public ministry, listen, it sounds just like what I read. He withdrew into Galilee, and he went into the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali. There we go again so that was spoke, what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled, the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people dwelling in darkness have seen a great light. 
and for those dwelling in the region and shadow of death, on them a light has dawned. That's this passage, introduction. The light is come, and we already know from the New Testament, fulfilled when he goes, he actually moves from being a carpenter around Nazareth, goes to Naphtali to the darkest corner, to a place that was known for its sin, and he begins his public ministry, fulfilling this Isaiah chapter 9. Whoa. You can't just salute him and say, oh yeah, oh yeah, this changes history. The light has come. There shall be, doesn't need to be, any more gloom. And gloom today is everywhere. You know that. It's in Washington, D.C. These people get along something like kindergarten. It's everywhere. It's down the street. It's in your heart sometimes. <coughs> and this prophecy is for all of us for today. There's an old Irish novel. I love this picture. George Moore wrote it, and don't worry about the whole novel, but there's an incident where men are building roads and shoveling, and, and the writer says, the men sang lustily as they built the roads, and then they found out the roads were not going anywhere. It was a gift from the government just to do work, and Moore's insightful statement, I quote, the men stopped singing as they built, the roads to nowhere are difficult to build. Listen to the Hollywood stars, listen to the people who lead the culture of today, listen to many of our public leaders, and all you hear at times is gloom. The roads to nowhere, if you don't know where you're going, hello, if you don't know why you're here at any age, it's gloomy. That's the background. But look at the next verse. You know this verse if you've ever celebrated Christmas. Verse 6. For to us a child is born, and to us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Unto us a child is born, a son is given. These words are by inspiration, nice of me to say so. I know you believe that here. Notice how carefully he chooses them. A child is born. By the word of the Lord, Mary is pregnant, and for nine months the Son of God lives in utero. Some of you are mothers, just the same way except by the word of God, a virgin birth. He says a child is born, once the pregnancy was there by the normal process, then he says a son is given, meaning the son always lived. Try that with your children sometime, explaining that his son has already always lived. This is the light who has always been there. Again, his best friend said he always was. And then he's going to come and shine in Bethlehem and in Geneva and wherever you live, if you like. And described by the prophet this event, a child is born, pregnancy, real. A son is given. Actually, in Hebrews, did you know this? It says, it quotes the son as saying, a body you have prepared for me. Whoa. The eternal son is coming into a human body so that he's fully God, fully baby. He was six for a whole year. He was 15 for a whole year. Took a long time because he wanted to drive chariots and couldn't get his driver's license. He was your age if you're under 33. This is the prophecy, and this is the light. Galatians would say, 
uh, Paul, the apostle, he said, unto us a son is given. In other words, he said, the son has come. And he says, God sent his son, born of a woman, not a man, born under the law, because he would keep the law for everyone at Chapel Street and the whole world, and those people who are going to get it in their own language, born under the law to redeem. It's a, it's a slave word, set you free. And if the Son makes you free, you'll be free indeed. That's what Galatians says, that God sent his Son at just the right time. So the angels would tell the shepherds, while well, there's bright light shining and the choir's singing, unto us is born this day a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Does that change your way of thinking about life in this world? Look what he says, God light, God's light comes as a person, verse 6, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Any questions? <laughs> Whoa! My father named me Newt because I said he was a Notre Dame fan. People today don't remember Newt Rockney like they should. I don't know why. <laughs> Churches don't talk about it enough. Um, when I go to a restaurant and they ask your name, I often say Lars because they never spell Newt right. Gingrich messed it up for all of us. Us Swedes. Anyway, not long ago at, a, at one of those restaurants, they said, what's your name? And I thought, I like my name, Newt. And I went, K-N-U-T-E. Five minutes later, I heard, couldn't <laughs> And I answered, and I went, his name is Wonderful Counselor. That means he's wise. It doesn't mean he... he He's a Bob Newhart counselor or your counselor or what you do. It means if you want to know truth, he's a wonderful counselor. Kings should listen to him. Presidents should listen to him. I should listen to him. Wonderful counselor. And someday his counsel will go all over the world. Do you believe that? Are you in on this? His second title is wonderful counselor mighty God, whoa, hero God, he's fully God. The Son is as much God as the Father and the Holy Spirit, this mystery of the Trinity. Mighty God who could say, let there be light, <clears throat> and there was light. That's the way the Bible begins. He made a universe that is so big, even Siri knows. How many galaxies are in the universe? The answer is two trillion. Two trillion galaxies in the universe. What should I say next? Interesting question. That's no help. 93 billion light years across is what they can tell us from Hubble Telescope. He's mighty God who did this with a flick of his wrist. Jeff said it in the sermon last week about what he does for us, uh, clothing us in his righteousness and wins the courtroom scene in, in Zechariah 3. But he's also Lord of all this universe, and he made you mighty God. Do you rest in that? Even when you can't answer what just happened? Third title. Just as big, his titles are so wonderful. Wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father. Don't get confused. He, there's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But he's the father of what's everlasting. He's the origin of eternity. He's in charge of eternity. He's Lord and Savior of eternal life for all of us if we wish. That's who he is. 
when he says this, Father of Eternity, I always think of on and on. The Hallelujah Chorus. I was kidding the choir about singing that. It's just uh, how great thou art. Hallelujah Chorus. And ever, and ever, and ever, and ever. If you don't like the choruses that keep repeating, remember that's what the Hallelujah Chorus does. Ever and ever, forever, amen. He's everlasting Father. It can, you just, you can't just go, okay. No, these are amazing claims. This is the one to come. 700 years later when Isaiah said it, the fourth title that he gives is Prince of Peace. And people all over the world will finally say, yes, finally, peace to the earth. But in the meantime, he said, do you believe this? My peace I give unto you. Not as the world or culture gives peace. I give you peace with God and with yourself. The gloom <laughs> is gone. Prince of Peace. One of my great concerns about churches I coach is do people get it? Who this Christ is? People sometimes say, yeah, I, we took a survey once at the chapel where I was, uh, and, and in answer to the question, how do you know you're a Christian, there were a whole bunch of answers that said, I've always been a Christian, or I was, I was in a Christian family. Okay, but what does it mean? That cross up there, when Jesus died, he took every one of your sins on his back. He paid the death price, separation from the Father. In fact, he cried out, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's what his death meant. He also cried out, it is paid for. So when we put our faith in him or trust him as Savior and Lord, his death counts for us. Don't you dare say, I'm being punished for my sins. The punishment for sin is death. Separation from the Father. And when you believe that, your judgment is already done. Whoa. When you put your faith in Christ, there's more. You don't go to heaven with a zero. I just got from three million to zero, forgiveness of sins. But when I put my faith in Christ, his righteousness now covers me. His righteousness is my covering in front of a holy God. It says in Romans chapter 4, our faith is counted as righteousness. It says in Romans 3, the righteousness of God has been given. This righteousness comes through faith in Jesus Christ. Friends, when you put your faith in Christ, it's not just like the demons. I believe in true and false demons. Jesus, son of God, true. Jesus died on the cross for the sins of the world, true. Jesus rose from the grave three days later, true. They were there. But when we believe in him and trust him as Savior, his death counts for us, his righteousness covers us. Whoa. Is that where you are? Prince of peace, he changes our lives. Mighty God, he is able to save. Wonderful counselor, follow me, he said, and live in combination with Christ. That's not part of the prophecy yet, but that's what he's going to say when he gets here. And he is all these things. Look at more of it. In verse 6, he began, A child is born, a son is given, the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called these four things. Verse 7, Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. Wow. Someday, if you're new to this, this really might sound a little strange. Someday, we believe this because it's all over Old and New Testaments. There will be a kingdom on earth and an eternal kingdom 
where the leader, the emperor, the president is Jesus Christ. And of the increase of his government, there'll be no end. The whole world will bow the knee. But first, he says, his government will be just. Look at that. Verse 7, and of peace, no end on the throne of David over his kingdom to establish and uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. I believe, good Christians don't all agree, but I believe Israel's going to be very central in that. Romans 9 to 11 says, Paul says, God has not forsaken Israel. The promise was to David. Tell your kids, David got it. One of your sons will rule over the earth someday. And now, it's a long, long time, and unto us is born this day in the city of David. <laughs> a son of David, a savior who is Christ the Lord. He doesn't start it. No, he has started it. That's right. His kingdom is in our hearts now. Romans says that. His kingdom is among Christians. Christians who live like this in combination with Christ already are people of justice and righteousness and love. But someday... He will make that over the whole world. And that's the eternal part here, which is so important. What he says for us is that this kingdom will rule over the whole earth. He'll shine forever, and the tenure of it, look at it, to establish and uphold it, and there will be no end, it says in verse 7, of the increase of his government, there will be no end on the throne of David and over his kingdom. This is our hope. Now waiting, it's been 2,000 years since Jesus said some of these things too. It would, be, it would be 700 years or so after Isaiah wrote this that Jesus was born. There would be 400 of those years would be silence. No word from God at all. They didn't know what to say in the synagogues. But waiting is not hard for God. One day is like a thousand years. I don't even understand what that means, but he sees the whole process. But this kingdom is coming. And to a world, to a world in gloom and wars, and North Korea, and Iran, and perhaps stuff you're facing right now, to a world of hopelessness comes this word, I want you to trust me. A light will come. He has come, but he's going to come back, and the increase of his government will be everywhere. Can you rest in that? He's the only one who can get me in with a holy God. He's the only one who can take away my dickering and bartering with God and saying, well, I'll try to keep the ten. No, when you have faith in Christ, his righteousness covers you. You're in. You're a part of this kingdom now, and someday we will be eternally and all over the globe and the universe. Whoa. If you're living in gloom, and not excited about your future. This church, this scripture, this pulpit has the answer for you. And his name is Jesus. For he shall save his people from their sins and from their gloom. That's the offer. Is he your light? Do you live like this? When he said, I am the light of the world, it was on the Feast of Tabernacles week. And if you know the Feast of Tabernacles, all over this holy city of Jerusalem, there are fires burning, huge torches. And this man stands there, a peasant to some people, a renegade, to the leaders, and he says, in the shadow of all these torches, 
I am the light of the world. One famous writer said he's either a liar and a lunatic or he's the very son of God. No one goes around saying, I am the light of the world. And that's who he is for us. And that's why we worship. Is he your light? Lord forever. He says in the next phrase, our assurance about this, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. The same one who said, let there be light and there was light. The same Lord who said to the Red Sea, stop and split. Because he says it, it is so. The zeal of the Lord of hosts. That's how we're assured. That's our hope. Jesus said to the Sea of Galilee when it was storming, stop it. <laughs> he didn't need a committee of angels to come and stop the wind. If he says it, it is so. He said to Lazarus, come out. If he says it, it is so. Lazarus walks out of a grave. If he says it and you're forgiven, he says it in the scriptures, it is so, whether you feel it or not. But abide in Christ. The zeal of the, you want to know how this will be? The same Lord who created the universe will make sure it happens. It's going to be. I love the story, it's supposed to be true, that comes from a Sunday school class. And a teacher said to her students, What has four legs and a bushy tail? and hops from branch to branch. And one little girl said, it sounds an awful lot like a squirrel, but it must be Jesus, because everything at church is Jesus. <laughs> and that's true. We always end up there. He's Lord of the universe. Who can show you how to live? Who can help you know how to get through the gloom that you may be in right now or this world? The one whose name is Wonderful Counselor. It must be Jesus. Who can be your help to get in on his eternal life and his bonded eternal spirit salvation? Who can help you do that? How about the one who is the mighty God. It must be Jesus. It is. Who can keep you in Christ all your life and take care of you for eternity, forever and ever? Stop worrying. It is the one whose name is Everlasting Father, Father of eternity, Lord of all time and space. It must be Jesus. Who will bring peace to this perverted world and finally correct all things and make them as they were meant to be? When he returns as Prince of Peace, it says the mountains will shake, the seas will roar. In fact, all the world will <laughs> clap their hands, the trees and the fields will do that, and all the world will bow their knee. He's back. He's back. He is Lord forever and ever. Is he your Lord on a daily basis? Someday, because of Jesus Christ, there will be no more gloom. <laughs> Let's pray. Father, thank you for your Son. From the prophets even, we see what can be. As you pray, thank God, not out loud, but in your own heart, for this Savior who wants to be your friend. If you're not there yet, ask God, is this true that if I put my faith in him, his death counts for me, his life spiritually connects with me? 
And God, help us live that way and worship that way and honor you as our Savior and Lord, please. We pray in the name of the one who walked on water and raised the dead and changed people's lives from darkness to light, Jesus the Christ. Amen. We're going to sing this wonderful worship hymn, Fairest Lord Jesus, Lord of all. It even says he's the light of the world, light of the sunshine. Please join in worship as we sing. Let's stand. <laughs> 